Blessed be to your holy name, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you from the rising of the sun to the going on of the same. Your name is to be hallowed, O oh God. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. What can we render to you, our God? You are a good God. You are a faithful God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We worship you, our Father in heaven. We give you glory, Lord. And we want to declare our love for you, our God. Yes. You have done so much for us. May our hearts be fixed on you, O oh God. May we be totally sold out to you, our God. May you raise praise, O oh Lord God, in our hearts, O oh God. That we may praise you, Lord, because you are a good God, a faithful God. As a family, Lord, oh my okay, we are forever grateful. Thank you, Father, in heaven, even for the deep things that you continue, Lord, to expose to us, our Father. Our prayer tonight is that we shall walk with renewed hearts, oh God. We shall walk with renewed hearts, oh Lord. A heart that are totally sold out to you, oh God. Serving you, oh dear Lord, we want our hearts, we want our souls, and we want our minds. Thank you, Father, for your presence in this place. Lord, we bless you, oh God. We surrender this native to you, that you may continue to tabernacle with us, oh God. But Father in heaven, what is ahead of us, oh dear Lord, you minister to us, oh God, in a beautiful and a powerful way. Oh Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you even Lord for the miracles that are happening to your God in our midst, oh God. You are ministering to your people, Jesus Christ, in this place. Oh, thank you Lord, thank you Almighty God, because many things that are happening to all those God in our midst, oh God. Oh Lord God, and we know, my Father, there shall be manifestations. There shall be testimonies, oh God, of what you are doing in our midst. Thank you, Holy Spirit of the living God. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Oh, my God, we bless you, Lord. We honor you, oh, God. We give you praise, oh, Lord. We give you our God. We adore you, Lord. We honor you, our God. We are not a God, Lord, but you, oh, God. We are not a God, but you, oh, dear Lord. We desire more of you, Lord. Let's go back to Have your way, Lord. Have your way tonight. Have your way to the door, God. Thank you, Father. You are alive. You are still God. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To somebody. And uh, to speak to us today is our leader, Apostle Phoebe Mugo. And I'm going to ask her to come forward so that um, we may pray together. 
our dear Heavenly Father. We are so grateful again, our Father, for the table that you have prepared for us. We thank you, Lord, because this is love that you have for us. Thank you so much, our Father, for the vessel that you have prepared, O oh God. We pray, Holy Spirit, you who is our teacher, our counselor, our guide, that you may use Apostle Phoebe in a very special way, that you would anoint her to be able to bring out that which you have put in her heart. We thank you, Father, for each and every one of us who is seated under your voice. We pray, O oh God, that our hearts, O oh Lord, shall be receptive to the teachings that you are giving us tonight. And no seed will fall at the wayside, but it shall fall on a fertile ground. And so, Lord, we thank you, we bless you. We plead the precious blood of Jesus over this facility, and we pray for open heavens, O Lord God, that you may continue to minister to us. We give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to the prayer training program of Intercessors for Kenya Ministries. Our topic today is shaping Kenya's destiny in the courts of heaven. I want to begin by presenting to us four objectives. One, to bring an understanding of how our covenant with God enriches our calling. Two, to understand how God shaped Israel's destiny through altars and covenants. Three, to see how Kenya's destiny is being shaped through evil altars and covenants. And four, to raise a petition and contend for Kenya's destiny in the courts of heaven. Our God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. Throughout history, mankind has achieved the greatest and mightiest deeds through covenanting with God. And this includes our salvation, which is the covenant between us and God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now open your textbooks to page, one, to page 98. I want to give you biblical validation that what we are saying and what we are going to learn tonight is true. There are several biblical covenants, five in the Old Testament and one in the New. We have the Adamic covenant, which you see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. The Adamic covenant seeks to correct the curses pronounced against mankind through God's provision for the sin of Adam through the seed of woman who will bruise a serpent's head, shown in verse 3, in chapter 3, verse 15. We have, we have the Noahic covenant seen in chapter 9. After the flood, God promised humanity that he would never again destroy all life on earth with a flood. God gave the rainbow as a sign of the covenant, a promise that the entire earth would never again flood and a reminder that God can and will still judge sin even today. The third covenant we see in the Old Testament is the Abrahamic covenant where God gave the Hebrews the promise of land. We have the Mosaic Covenant, where God took them out of bondage into freedom, where he gave them guidelines for living and for worship, and eventually they attained the land of promise. The Davidic Covenant gave a promise of an everlasting kingship in the lineage of David, and then we have the New Testament Covenant uh, for our present salvation and for our eternal redemption. Now you'll be able to find the Mosaic Covenant written in your textbook from page 100, the Davidic in from page 101, and the New Testament one in page 108. So those we will not go through, but I urge you to read them in your own time. 
From page 99, please open your textbooks. We want to see the components of a covenant. And I put it to you that covenants have six basic components. Number one, a covenant is entered into at an altar. It is between two individuals or two groups of people. A priest presides over a covenant and then there must be regulations that clearly state what the terms and conditions and penalties of the covenant are. Very important. You're going, at one time this week, you're going to be dealing with the terms, conditions, and penalties of covenants that you and your family have entered into as we pray, as guided in the WhatsApp world. So I need you to understand what we are talking about. So these regulations can be in the form of oaths, vows, or promises. And in a covenant, tokens are exchanged and blood sacrifices are offered. So those are six components that are, fine and that are found in covenants. And in themselves, they are indicators that a covenant has taken place. When you see these six things, it indicates to you that a covenant has taken place. So these components can be traced in the biblical covenants that I have already mentioned. And I want to seek to trace them in the marriage covenant as an example. I want to bring it home with something that you are familiar with and you can say, yes, indeed, I understand what you're talking about, covenant. So go to page 99. And we want to look at these six components in the marriage covenant. Uh, number one, the marriage covenant is entered into by two people, male and female. And I want you to note that in the biblical covenant, there is no place for a man entering a marriage covenant with another man or a woman with another woman. For as long as they try to cheat us, don't believe them. Don't ever, ever, ever believe them. If you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, and then chapter 2, verse 20 to 25, when Pastor Bob was teaching on the family, he took us through those, so I'm not going to repeat it. But in summary, God made male and female and blessed them to be fruitful and to multiply. The second component is these two people who want to get married, they present themselves at an altar, an altar of God. And uh, the altar of God that we have today that we would recognize is the church. So one should be very careful to enter into a covenant of this magnitude in a godly church. That may sound funny but not all churches have the right foundations. So you need to choose a church with the right foundation, correct doctrines, and correct practices. Do not just choose any church, but one that has a godly foundation and godly doctrines. It has become fashionable for some people to hold wedding ceremonies in all kinds of places that look attractive to them. Not all these places are godly. The best altar of God at present remains the church. Now I'm going to ask you to, in your own time, read page 104, and you'll be able to see the purpose of godly altars. I want you to see how a godly altar influences the covenant, and then you'll understand why I'm urging you, all your children, as you will advise them, to enter into the marriage covenant in a godly church because where you enter your covenant will have an effect on your relationship. Number three, we have a priest. The priest conducts the ceremony as the go between man and God and again choose a true godly representative of God to preside over your covenant. Brother Lubala said some things about that when he was teaching. I believe you will remember and then the two make vows, 
and uh, often we say I take thee to be my lawfully wedded husband or lawfully wedded wife and so on. The traditional wedding vow illustrates the kind of commitment that is demanded in a covenant. When we say, I take thee, and then we add in sickness and in health, for better and for worse, we witness to the fact if that relationship turns out to be unprofitable for us, we will not abandon our partner because of hardships. And this is a vow that we make. This is a vow that we make. Vows invite blessings, but they also invite curses upon those who make them and then break them. So never make a vow that you cannot keep. Saying until death do us part means we are married until death. It includes the idea that nothing but death can end the covenant. Number five, the two then exchange tokens and in marriage we tend to use rings. Uh, this uh, tradition of the wedding ring originated in Egypt where civilization began and somehow many parts of the world have picked on it and are using it. The reason is because the ring is circular in nature and is seen as a symbol of eternity. It's endless, just endless. It goes on and on and on. It was seen to have no beginning and no end, thus marking the eternal nature of a marriage covenant. And then the marriage union is sealed by blood at the breaking of the hymen. By the shedding of blood, the covenant is sealed. And I believe the aspect of consummation of a marriage is very, very important, even lawfully, such that if a marriage was not consummated, it can be annulled. Now, I want us to see how God shaped Israel's destiny through altars and covenants. And uh, as I talk, you'll be able to see the six components, even as we look at the Abrahamic covenant on page 100. And I want you later again to take time to study Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 22. Because all these things I'm saying very quickly come from those chapters. But what we see in the Abrahamic covenant is that it was established out of a revelation by God. Genesis 17 verse 2, the Lord said, I will confirm my covenant. It began, the idea originated with him. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant. Verse 9, he said, keep my covenant, use the word my, to show that it was his. The same with verse 10. And then we see that it was entered into by two parties till Genesis 17. Verse 2, the Lord said, I will confirm my covenant between me and you. So it's between God and Abraham. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you. And then we see the altar in Genesis 12, and in a while we'll see several other altars that are party to this covenant. But verse 7 says, so Abraham built an altar, verse 8 says, there he built another altar. The priest is described in Genesis 22, verse 16. We are told God presided over the covenant himself as the priest and swore to fulfill it according to the highest name in heaven and on earth, which is his own name. Chapter 22, verse 16. There are promises in covenants, Genesis chapter 12, Gen Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 17. Chapter 12, verse 2 to 3, the Lord says, I will make you into a great nation. He's making a promise to Abraham. Chapter 15, verse 5, he says, he gives him a promise of offspring. Chapter 17, verse 4 to 7, he says he'll make him a father of many nations. So he's talking of fruitfulness. He says, I will make nations of you and kings will come out of you. And then there's a promise of the land in Canaan. And then we have the tokens, Genesis 17, verse 10 and 11, you are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. 
And then verse 13, the sign of the covenant is to be in your flesh. I talked of blood. Genesis 59, there was a heifer, a goat, a ram. They were cut into half. The birds were offered in whole. Verse 17, we see a smoking brazier with a blazing torch passing between the pieces. And we're told that that was a spirit of God coming to confirm the covenant. Do you have a mobile microphone? Okay. I want somebody to give us the six components of a covenant. Can you just pass the microphone around, put up your hand? Six components of a covenant. No looking. Okay, Patricia, don't look anywhere. Altar. Six of them. Okay, an altar, um, a token, the blood, um, two parties, and then prison. One more. Oh, a vow. Vows, yeah, and promises. Thank you. So please, please, please. Yes, you can go ahead and clap, keep those in mind. But I want to say a bit more about the Abrahamic covenant and uh, the role that altars and covenants played in shaping the destiny of Israel. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, this was at Shechem, Abraham built the first altar at the place that God had appeared to him. The word appeared is key. There's going to be another quiz in a minute. And this time I won't allow you to volunteer. I will volunteer you. <laughs> a human being can therefore raise an altar at the place where they encounter a spiritual being, where God appears to you. I'm not asking you to go and put up a statue. For me, the Lord appeared to me so seven times, so significantly in the house we used to live in before. So we raised our house as an altar. We considered our home as an altar, okay? A house of God, a place that the Lord appeared to me quite physically in the same way that I'm seeing you seven times. Genesis 12, verse 8, this second altar was erected in Bethel, and the reason was to secure, secure the land. Okay, so altars are used to secure the land. Number one, altars are raised at where God has appeared. Second, two, secure the land. Genesis 13, verse 14 to 18, this is the third altar, it was raised at Hebron, and it was erected both to secure land, but also to mark the promise that God had made to Abraham and his descendants. So we note that altars mark and seal promises Promises, promises. Okay. And then Genesis 26, verse 23 to 25, this is at Beersheba. Isaac, like his father, set up an altar at the place God appeared to him. So God appeared to Isaac also. And he raised an altar at the place that the Lord had appeared to him. Now this shows us that the next generation can partake of the promises that were made to their forefathers by raising altars and taking claim of earlier promises. Okay? So now we are talking of the next generation. They can partake of what God had told their forefathers. In Genesis 28, verse 10 to 22, the fifth altar is erected at Bethel. Jacob set up an altar, we are told, a pillar, and he poured oil on it. He experienced an open heaven and described the place as the gate of heaven. Beautiful, huh? Yes, so where there is an altar, you experience an open heaven. 
Okay? And uh, he described it as the gate of heaven. Verse 13 to 15, God reinforced his promise to give the land to the descendants of Abraham. Promises are reinforced at altars. Promises are reinforced at altars. Jacob raised an altar and anointed it. Covenants can be strengthened at altars. So the other key word is strengthened at altars. And then verse 20 to 22, at an altar, we can, co we can covenant to enter, or let me say we can agree to enter a covenant relationship with God. He offers to do certain things for us, and we promise to do certain things for him. And this is something you both can and should do but allow the Lord to initiate it, just be available and sensitive as he speaks to you. It is through covenant promise, even as the Lord appeared to me in our home seven times, that he launched me to begin to start prayer movements. So it, it is, it, you can actually launch a ministry through covenant, covenanting with the Lord. Genesis 33, verse 18 and verse 20, the sixth altar was raised in Shechem. Jacob had asked for safety. Here we read that he arrived safely. So he erected the sixth altar and uh, he named it El Elohi Israel. So we see that altars can be named. Altars can be named uh, in a while. You give me some of the names of the altars we have in Kenya. And then Genesis 35, verse 13 to 15, at Bethel, Jacob erected the seventh altar and he poured wine and oil on it. And I believe that the wine symbolized the blood of Jesus, even though Jesus was not known in the sense that we know him today. And the oil would have symbolized the Holy Spirit. So this altar was anointed both by the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And uh, you can see that this is the seventh, the seventh altar. What do we know about number seven? Perfection and completion. So you, you need to take note that because of the strength of the Abrahamic covenant, the Israelites cannot be moved from the Holy Land. Several times in their history they have been dispersed, but they have always gone back. The longest dispersion being from AD 70 to AD 1948, but they still went back. That is the strength of a covenant, and that is the strength of altars. Seven altars were raised in the Abrahamic covenant and seven marks completion and perfection. So God continued to shape the destiny of Israel also through the Mosaic and David covenants. It, the Davidic, it was not just the Abrahamic one, it's just that time cannot allow me to teach you all those in one evening. Now I want us to look at the origin of ungodly, of ungodly covenants in Africa you can just see all that, all the five covenants in the Old Testament. God is working through Israel, through covenant promises, altars and all these. And Satan is watching over many, many thousands of years. Satan is watching how God works. And then he decides to do a copy and a paste. This quotation comes from Shegun Nolani Pekun, who was our coach many years ago. When we were learning to be intercessors, he said that God's, you know, Satan stole and sold blueprints of divine things to humanity. Instead of using covenants for the good of mankind, 
He used it to afflict and destroy them. So for many centuries, our forefathers did not know the true God. Nor did they know how to worship him in spirit and in truth. So Satan took advantage of this ignorance and led them into idolatrous lifestyles. And many of these were tied to demonic covenants and evil altars. For many of us, our foundations are steeped in idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery, divination, and all manner of wickedness. If you go back four generations, how many of you had a godly heritage? Four generations behind you, godly heritage? Four generations? Okay, both your great, great, great grandparents, your mom and dad side were godly. They were born again, serving the Lord. Okay, so I think most of us did not. Most of us did not. Here and there we might have had a believing great-great-grandparent, but here and there we see traces of idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery, divination, and all manner of wickedness. And this is why we find this entanglement of bondages that we were talking about in our third lesson this term, bondages. Uh, when Brother Luvala was teaching us, he showed us that a building cannot stand if the foundation is wrong. So if the foundations of your families and communities are steeped in all these idolatrous things, then you keep seeing the negative patterns that you have perhaps been seeing in your family. Traditionally, events that led communities to enter ungodly covenants occurred during drought, famine, severe floods, plague, or war. Our forefathers would approach the spiritual leader of the community, uh, as a traditional priest, I would probably see him as a medium, and they would ask this traditional priest, can you talk to the gods, whatever the gods of that tribe and that community were those years, and ask the gods, why, what have we done that we have this drought or this famine or this calamity has fallen upon us? The priest would consult these so-called gods, which of course would be spirits, uh, because they didn't know Jehovah. And then he would go back to the community and he would tell them that God say it is and it says various things. You've done this or you've not done this. And that is why this calamity has come upon us. And of course, when you ask Satan a question, the answer you get is a lie, isn't it? Yes, unfortunately, they were being lied to. But a negotiation would follow where the gods would promise to do certain things if the community also did certain things. Now, and th this whole activity of calamity, inquiry, the priest goes and comes back with answers and they agree on certain things, also began to follow this pattern that we are learning about tonight. Follow me from page 5, 105. The altar would be where the villagers met. Where the villagers met. They gather together and uh, they meet and their religious leader comes to talk to them. They send him, he comes back and he talks to them at this altar. This place very often was by a sacred tree for the community. Sometimes it was by a water bed that they believed was holy. Sometimes it's just maybe a supernatural rock according to their belief and their understanding. I have said before while teaching that if you keep going to a specific place and meet with demons in that place, that place will eventually get supernatural power. Okay, not because God created a tree to be supernatural but because you keep going to that tree. You are turning it into an altar. You are turning it into a meeting point with demons. 
So it will begin to become a supernatural place. And then it now begins to attract more people because they feel when I sit under that tree, something happens. Okay? When I go to this water, something happens. All right. So that's really what's going on. So even in your community, you are likely to have discerned the person who always arises to take leadership. Have you seen? Yes. No one who always arises to take leadership. Right now we're talking of the negative, we're not talking of the positives, I'm not talking of the past or something like that. Eh? And then the promises would be to perform rituals regularly as demanded by these gods. So with time, they'll be saying, the reason this calamity has come upon you is because you neglected the rain festival, or the planting festival, or the harvesting festival, you know, things like those, eh? Or did you, you did not give sacrifices to the gods when your sons were going to war. And then very many times, they would also want something to be done at childbirth in order to avert this calamity when you have children perform this ritual. In order to avert this calamity when you have children name them like this or initiate them like this or do this when they're getting married or do this when they're getting buried. Unfortunately, a lot of our African traditions were came up in a very, very wrong way and for very, very wrong reasons. Let's go to number five, tokens and sacrifices. We are still on the, we are still on the components of traditional covenants, tokens and sacrifices. In our African traditions, there's a tendency to blend tokens with blood sacrifices. For example, body marks. Satan over the years has caused our people to mark their bodies with tribal marks. So they would cut their bodies on their head, their cheeks, their chest. I know some would do it for beauty. Some would do it for medicinal purposes. Sometimes medicine is put inside. But we have found it when we do deliverance that cutting of the body in these ways has opened up many, many people for demonic infiltration. The place you cut, as that ceremony becomes an open door for demonic infiltration. Tokens have also been items such as rings worn on all kinds of various parts of the body, beads, especially the ones which are worn on the waistline or on the feet, uh, on the legs, you kind of wonder why it should be there. Candles, pieces of cloth, when growing up, my mom would always warn us not to take gifts of beads or coins from strangers. I'm not uh, spoiling the reputation of Ugandans, it's just that that's where I grew up. It was very common for witches to throw a, a, a ten cent coin on the path of the child as you're going to the shops. Very common that you'd pick it and that would give them an opening into your life for them to begin to bewitch you. So my mom used to tell us not to pick coins. I later on as a teenager, I thought my mom was superstitious. But when I reached age 30 and I started doing deliverance, I realized she was wise. <laughs> and she knew what she was talking about. So you can, you, they want to bewitch you through these tokens. And then still on tokens and blood sacrifices, as I said, in our traditions, we tend to put them together. Blood sacrifices range from hens, goats, sheep, cows, and human beings. And uh, many times when uh, a traditional priest asks for uh, a hen, goat, sheep, or whatever, they, they are asking for a substitution of a certain person. So when you take this hen, you have not actually taken a hen, you have taken your son or your daughter, represented by the hen or by the goat or by the sheep, just in the same way that Jesus was a substitutionary offering for us, isn't he? He was the lamb of God that was slain. So Satan copies this and uses it to our harm and our destruction. 
But whenever a very huge covenant was needed because the suffering of the community was very, very strong, they'd give larger animals like bulls or buffaloes or something uh, because the condition was very, very adverse. But human beings have also been given as sacrifices directly or through orchestrated accidents. And whenever a human sacrifice is given, a male is, ten, is seen to be a more worthy sacrifice. And of the male, the firstborn male seems to be the most worthiest sacrifice. So when the price that is required of the community to, to pay is very high, they will ask for the firstborn male sons. Where such a person is offered, the devil will form a strong covenant to that community, but this male will become devoted to the devil and will begin to experience numerous strongholds in their lives. So don't be surprised when you look generally in your wider family that the firstborn males seem to have so many dis dysfunctional lifestyles and many, many strongholds. And it tends to point back to their being devoted. Now today people practice traditions and when you ask them why they do it, they say, we don't know. It's the way it has always been done. I gave you a moment to discuss and I asked that everybody talks. So none of you are without, will have any excuse to do these things and say it is because they've always been done. You are wiser than that. Judge them and see whether they are righteous or they are idolatrous. Now you remember all the things we said about when you indulge in these covenants at an altar? you maintain and you strengthen the oaths that your forefathers made when they entered into these ungodly covenants. So you keep doing these things, you're maintaining, you're reinforcing, you are strengthening all the idolatry of your forefathers. So essentially, even I know the Lord says that he punishes for the sin of, of four generations. But you know the tendency is we ourselves repeat the sins of our forefathers. So by the time we are being punished, we are also being punished for what we have done. As we have repeated the sins of our forefathers. We reinforce, we maintain, we strengthen. All those things that I was asking you to repeat when you were going through the covenant with Abraham. So there are many festivals and celebrations that we indulge in, in the guise of tradition and culture, in which negotiations and transactions become the renewal of the original covenants with ancestral and territorial spirits. So we, you need to come out from among them you need to be separate. The place of ungodly covenants, page 106, these practices tend to begin in families and communities and eventually become national. In our lifetime, we have seen altars in the form of statues and monuments. A keen study shows that these have a deeper purpose than just being tourist attractions. Now I just have four, uh, four examples and you're going to tell me the others. That's Dead and Kimathi, Monument of a National Heroes, Tom Boyer. And then we have this National Monument at the Uru Gardens, raised to mark our independence. And then we have the Nayo Monument that tell President Moi to have his power and strengthen his leadership. Okay, so we are looking at the place of altars in ungodly covenants. And I need to present to you the satanic altars are raised by the revelation of Satan. They are not innocent. They are not innocent. He gives the design, he tells them the material to be used, he says the sacrifices to be offered, and he says the purpose that that altar will serve. 
Altars are raised in order to control people and land, in order to determine which spirit owns and controls the land, to determine who comes into an area to build a church, sometimes even to start a business for that matter, and uh, you can be resisted and you can fail to start and succeed in your business in that territory. It can present difficulty in church planting and in evangelism. There are people who go to plant churches. They are battered by things they cannot see. They give up and they flee. They manipulate marriages, marriage breakdowns, affect community health, manipulate elections and politics. A lot of our national altars have been for the purpose of manipulating elections and politics. We permit certain men or women to attain political power over others. So you will read uh, the rest of that chapter. Was it page 106? I want to go to political altars and covenants. And this was our third objective, which says to see how Kenya's destiny is being shaped through evil altars and covenants. So far you've understood that Satan observed how God was using altars and covenants to shape the destiny of Israel. You have understood that he stole heavenly blueprints and he has been using corrupted. Uh, what was Pastor Benson telling us? There's a counterfeit, but it's based on the original. So he has seen the original, then he has the counterfeit. And he's been doing this for centuries because he also wants to shape the destiny of nations. For his advantage, of course, not for God's. Why is Satan stealing blueprints? Because he knows that the one who owns the altar will own the land. So he wants his altars on the land. He knows that the one who owns the land, the altar controls the people. So he wants to, he wants to control the people. He knows that the one who owns the altar shapes the destiny of nations. Remember what we saw about the destiny of Israel since Abraham, 6,000 years ago? You can't take the land from them. That's how powerful this whole thing is. So Satan wants to imitate it. He wants to do the same. So we're going to look at the same pattern beginning with altars. Political altars have been raised as sources of power for various individual national leaders, also for political parties and for various ethnic groups to enable them to gain power. You know, we only talked of the altars in Nairobi, but there are so many others elsewhere. However, in Kenya, we have two key altars. Maybe even be the altars, look, the strongholds, there are places that serve at a political level. We, one is at the top of Mount Kenya, and the other one is in Lake Victoria. We are therefore not surprised that our founding fathers, Jomo and Jeromogi, were associated with Mount Kenya and Lake Victoria. Priesthood. Um, the, the biggest priesthood that we are aware of are the Mau Mau, and more recently the Mongiki. And they have served as a priesthood of many covenants and have been used to bring about the amount of blood required in such covenants. Other priesthoods have been drawn from recognized witches and wizards from every single community. There's no community that is innocent of this. Sacrifices in order to give power to those who inquire of him, Satan will tell them how much blood he needs and they will find ways of giving him what he has asked for. Blood has been drawn through tribal clashes over many years, ethnic violence, and sometimes even through accidental buildings, collapsing, road accidents, sometimes they're not accidents, but they're planned. And then tokens have largely been through body parts. Human beings disappear and are found later, often with their genitals, missing breasts, tongues, and a lot of these things have been used to lay foundations of these altars that we're talking about. And various communities have their different types of tokens, but this is pretty standard. We have other altars in Kenya, 
Again, found in every community. <laughs> Let me mention but a few. Kaya Forest, Mount Kenya Shrines. Uh, I've mentioned the one in Lake Victoria, Goddesses of the Waters in the Indian Ocean. Some consult um, in Kitui, or Tanzanian wizards, because they're known to be powerful. Others visit Mukure wa Nyagathanga in Muranga. <laughs> or Koitalel Samoe Shrine in Nandi. We have Suswa Caves in Masai land. The Bindu altar on the equator near Kisumu or the Ramogi altar. Koitobo Shrine in Mount Elgon. A Sego Hills in Homo Bay or God Quay in Migori. And you know the others from your area. In addition to these, we have, we must include modern altars that have been erected as monuments and statues in our central business district. Some were erected by the colonialists and some by our own politicians. And we have taken time to mention them between Seren Hotel, across Uhuru Park, towards the Parliament, KICC, the law courts, towards the New Stanley, Uhuru Gardens, and so on. We have such monuments in almost every town in Kenya. From these altars, page 106, a link between the earth, which is the natural, and the spirit world, the supernatural, is established. Remember the open heaven, the Jacob experience, when he put his head on an altar? The spiritual realm opened. He had an open heaven. And it happens also with the demonic altars. People have an opening into the realm of the spirit and they can connect to the spiritual realm. Political power is determined. Uh, some political power is subdued and others are elevated depending on who gives the sacrifices, tokens that the Satan wants. You can be elevated and others can be subdued. Powers are given to those who meet the requirements of the covenants, the one who gave the tokens required, yes, the way I've said it, the ones who shed the blood demanded and met the conditions of the covenant. So you need to know what an altar is. That place is a barricade from where demons gather, then launch out to attack and go back to lay more strategy. It is a demonic headquarter. It is a place where those tied to these covenants meet to strengthen and renew the vows, the oaths, the covenant, the promises that they made. You'll see that ungodly altars drive the presence of God away from his people through sorcery, witchcraft, enchantments, and so on. They enslave the people. They take a hold of their resources they want to control institutions, government, the economy, want to put all these under satanic control. And most of all, evil altars invite the wrath of God over the people, over communities, and over nations. I really, really appeal to you, intercessors for Kenya, not to just be classroom intercessors, sitting here with your notebooks and taking notes I want you to participate in the battalion prayer drives and prayer walks because it is there that you will encounter the things that I'm talking about and it is there that you will be able to subdue the works of Satan in the land. Does it not annoy you to know that the one who controls the altar controls the land? Do you want it to stay like that? Then go and do something about it. Okay? I just want you, if you really, really want God to use you to make a difference, even before I finish, and I still have a bit before I finish, would you just stand up now? If you really, really want God to use you to make a difference, so when your battalion leader tells you you're going on this prayer drive and this prayer walk, you're going to avail yourself because you are annoyed that these altars have been put in our nation and the one who owns the altar or owns the land, and you want this situation to change. Does that make you frustrated? Why? Why should the enemy own the land? Why should you own Gong Road? 
Why should you the mountain of media, education, economy? Why? We need to get annoyed. I want to commission you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I want to commission you and send you out that you will go and counter the works of Satan at the various altars that he has caused our forefathers and political leaders to erect in this nation, that you'll be able to pull down, destroy, tear down, and you'll be able to rebuild and plant after divine and heavenly patterns as will be given unto you by the Lord. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Now we want to look at shaping Kenya's destiny in the courts of heaven. And um, we are going to do this as a process. We started today. <clears throat> and I need all of you to be in the WhatsApp prayers. We started today. We are following the guidelines for deliverance in the textbook. You can open page 145. And today we prayed from page 145. Because for us to shape Kenya's destiny, we need a right standing before God that will, give, that will qualify us to be able to address him in the courts of heaven. So we are going to be giving you prayers, starting with page 145 today. If you haven't done it, please go and do it. Um, we have failed to qualify to stand in the courts of heaven because our hearts are not right. So today we are judging the state of our hearts and we are making sure that the state of our heart is right. Judge the state of your heart in view of the wrong foundations that have been, that have allowed bondages to take a hold of you, your family, and your community. And you're seeing all these negative patterns that we were told in lesson three in your family. And then we will continue each day. In shaping the destiny of Kenya in the courts of heaven, we therefore begin with establishing a right standing with God that gives us a legal license to enter his courts. Two, we ruthlessly judge the state of our hearts so we can be qualified to represent Kenya in the courts of heaven. And I believe right now, God is searching for men and women he can entrust the nation to. Uh, we are all bothered about riots, demonstrations. We are bothered about our peace being um, disrupted, not being able to go to work. Yes, I, I know in many ways we want to change, we want better economy, we want to be able to afford um, what a better cost of living and all that, I know that. Maybe we just wonder, but can it be done in a different way? I'm not trying to be forward or forward as a meal. I'm, I'm just talking about the situation as it is. And the Lord has a solution and he has an answer to the problem that Kenya is in right now. And he's looking for men and women into whose hands he can entrust the nation so that you can take Kenya by the hand and lead her. Will you qualify to take Kenya by the hand and lead her? Number three, we need to receive revelation. Last Monday, or oh, I don't know if it was, on, I think it was during the National Altar, I said, if you really want to see a difference, you might choose to fast through the week. And if you fast, you, it's easier to sensitize your spirit and you might receive a revelation on how to bring Kenya into covenant relationship with God. We need revelation about the kind of altar we ought to raise. Because before an altar is raised, God gives supernatural revelation on how and why it should be raised. An example is found in Exodus 20, verse 24. God describes the kind of altar he wants it. It even says what it should be made of. It says what should be offered on it. And it says the end result of making that altar. Altars are therefore never raised by human inspiration. The one raising them receives a supernatural revelation on how and why to raise it. Number four, I believe, however, that the bride of Christ is an altar that God is working with right now. God is building an altar made of living stones, stones that have been purified and tested. It is, uh, my friend Benjamin Wimmer likes to say, the dealings of God. 
God is stones that have been purified and tested through the dealings of God. That is what he would say. It's not about places. It's not about buildings. It's not about monuments. God is not asking us that. Unless you can establish your home, we can establish our I4K office, fine. But it's really not about things built with stone. Uh, the Lord, we are the altar of prayer. We are the altar of covenant promises that the Lord is raising. From us, the Holy Spirit intercedes with sighs and groanings too deep for words. The covenant promises are for the bride, for her preparation and ultimate marriage supper with the Lamb. Number five, we can draw from the tokens and sacrifices in our covenants with our, which are the body and blood of Jesus. Hebrews 7.27 says, who unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for our sins once for all when he offered himself. Number six, he presides over our covenant as the priest from the highest order of priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 20 and following, we read, Athens became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. These are the components of our covenant with God. And we can stand on this, the strength of this covenant to now and destroy, pull down and tear down all wrong agreements in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, and even in our nation. At independence, God had a blueprint for Kenya. And we need to arise now to restore this blueprint. God gave a revelation on the kind of Kenya he wanted. He sent 12 priests to the founding father of the nation with this blueprint, but he neither had the spiritual capacity to comprehend it nor to act upon it. We lost the blueprint because the church was not at the right place to advise national leaders at that time. But now we know better, and we have a duty to restore God's blueprint for our nation. This word has recently been reinforced by various servants of God who have now put a timeline as the Septuagint year. As Kenya approaches 70 years since independence, God desires to bring us into our divine destiny. Over many years, God has told us that He has a different type of leader for the nation of Kenya because Kenya is special unto God. He wants to give us a righteous and upright leader. He wants to raise Kenya to a standard that would even make Israel envious. While praying with a team of ministers on 30th May, the Lord spoke to us both profoundly and with much clarity that his Davidic leader for Kenya can only be provided by a man with a Davidic anointing. When God sent someone to anoint David, he was looking for a man after God's own heart. When someone saw Elia, he thought, surely the Lord's anointing must be upon this man. But the Lord said to someone, ah, that's not the one, keep looking. Then Jesse called Abinadab, Abinadab and had him pass in front of Saba. 
This time, it's someone who says that God has not chosen this one either. When presented with two key principles in the run up to the national elections, Christians tend to speak like the rest of Kenya by declaring that we only have two horses in the race. So one of the two must be the David. Samuel did not stop as two horses. Elia and Abinadab. Not even the other five sons of Jesse. He asked Jesse, are these the only horses in the race for kingship? The answer was, there is another one. And someone said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Someone pressed in until he found the David, the chosen leader, the anointed king of Israel. The church in Kenya is a person in. Instead, we turn Elia or Abinadab into the David. We force the word of God to suit the present situation. We are too lazy to pursue the matter until we find the blueprint for Kenya and we are making political errors that are costly for Kenya's prophetic destiny. We are those who have ears here what the Spirit of God is saying to the church in Kenya. But I want to declare to you that God has not given up on us. We will recover and we will restore the blueprint for Kenya as given and designed by God. Kenya will secure the promises that God has for the people and for the land. He will do this for the sake of his honor, his glory, and his praise.